Okay, let's uh, find out about this thing called the skyscraper curse. Some of you have already heard of it. Everybody else probably thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> but I think you'll find this very interesting and hopefully informative. The skyscraper curse was first discovered by a real estate investment analyst named Andrew Lawrence in China in January of 1999. And basically what this skyscraper curse is, is the unlikely correlation of building the world's tallest skyscraper and an ensuing economic crisis or collapse. And based on the research that I've been doing over time, I've expanded uh, Mr. Lawrence's index historical index, as he calls it, his period went from 1907 through 1999. We've been able to extend that backwards in time into the late 19th century and then extending it forward to the present. Andrew Lawrence focused only on record-setting tall buildings. So only when new records were set on buildings of a height of usable, livable space. So we're not talking about giant antennas or floating balloons or anything else. Uh, we're talking about real buildings with real space. For example, in New York City, uh, the, what was once called the Freedom Tower and, and is now called the... Um, the Trade Tower, uh, has set a record-setting height, but the 400 top feet of the building are just a spire, just an ornament that was placed on top of the building, not real usable space. And you'll see why that's important. Record-setting skyscrapers are started during a, an extended period of economic growth or a boom uh, in the economy, very often a bubble uh, in the economy. And then these record-setting tall skyscrapers are usually finished after the economic crisis is readily apparent. So we're not talking about just overall construction spending or overall real estate investment. It's very specific, and you'll see why it has to be a record tall building of usable space. So after Lawrence, uh, the skyscraper index successfully uh, told us about the dot-com bubble, and it successfully told us about the housing bubble, and we also have a new world record-setting skyscraper that's under construction in Saudi Arabia that would set a new world's record. Some examples of these curses are the Panic of 1907 uh, was co coincided with the building of the Singer Building and the Metropolitan Life Building. Okay, life insurance and Singer sewing machines were very big back then, and so we had a, a cluster of two record-setting skyscrapers, in 1913, the Woolworth building set a new world's record. Now, what's the problem with that? No crisis. No crisis. So this was always thought to be, by Lawrence, an exception to this correlation. And then we had the Great Depression, where 40 Wall Street set the record, that's now the Trump building. Then the Chrysler building surpassing that, and ultimately the Empire State building uh, surpassing that. So we had a cluster of three records um, that all began in 1929 and were subsequently completed in 
1930 and 1931. And then it takes a while, but in the early 1970s, the, the bubble economy of the 1960s came to an end. There was trouble in the labor market. There was trouble um, in stock markets, and there were several recessions. It's referred to as the stagflation of the 1970s that lasted up until 1982 when the United States finally uh, got rid of the grip of stagflation and really economic depression because uh, in the early 1980s, unemployment rate was 10% or higher. Uh, inflation was 10% or higher. Uh, interest rates at one point were 18%. Then the 1997 Asian financial crisis um, coincided with the Patronus Towers in Asia. And then Taipei 101 was lined up with the dot-com bubble. In effect, the technology bubble of the 1990s started really in Asia. And then due to currency changes, that bubble transferred itself from countries uh, like Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and, and so forth to the United States um, and elsewhere. And then finally, um, we have the housing bubble and the financial crisis. The Burj Khalifa Tower in um, Dubai in the Middle East uh, set the world's record We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go on. But when I saw this skyscraper curse or skyscraper index of curses, I thought to myself, this is the embodiment of the Austrian business cycle theory. This has all of the ingredients that we typically discuss with Austrian business cycle theory. So I wrote a paper, it was finally published, in 2005 in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, it's called Skyscrapers and Business Cycles. And basically what it does is it provide, provides links from Austrian business cycle theory to the skyscraper curse. And basically, as you know, in Austrian business cycle theory, it's all started off by artificially low interest rates, right? And these artificially low interest rates, I contend, cause three different types of Cantillon effects. Now, Cantillon effects, simply put, is that when there's significant changes in the money supply, that's going to cause changes in prices in the economy. It's going to lead to real effects in the economy, and it's going to lead to changes in the distribution of wealth in an economy. The first Cantillon effect shows that the interest rate increases land prices. Now, why would a lower interest rate increase the price of land? Just want to make sure you've got your thinking cap still with you. <laughs> yes. Uh, because as interest rates go down, it's easier to access loans, and then loans you buy land, and that pushes the price. That's certainly one of the, the factors. Uh, but when you have low interest rate, um, you also lower the opportunity cost of, of holding onto the land. Uh, but there's a lot of different channels in which low, lower interest rates raise land prices. And one thing if, yes? Um, it, it, um, the price, because the price needs to, is um, sort of the discount on the future rents of the land. A lower interest rate increases the prices, the capital value of the land. Today. Yeah, the discounted value of the flow of, of incomes. And if you're observant, what you'll notice here in the U.S. and elsewhere is that you see a lot more signs along roads and interstates saying land for sale. And the reason there's more signs now is that the price is higher and people have been holding on to land for a long time see this as an opportunity to unload those properties at much higher prices. 
Now, what would higher land prices have to do with record-setting skyscrapers? Yes. If the land price is higher, there's a bigger incentive to build taller in order to get the, get the most possible benefit out of the land that you bought uh, higher price. Perfect. Perfect. If you have, a, if you buy a piece of land when it's a, at a higher price, it means you have to somehow be able to get income or rental income in order to justify that higher purchase price. And so instead of building just one story, you might build three stories in order to justify that higher land price. And if you look at Auburn nowadays, you'll see a couple of very large projects, um, one down just down the street on Glen, uh, and you'll also find one on campus. I, I noticed that there was a super high construction crane at another spot on campus. And so higher land prices lead to taller buildings. Okay, the second Cantillon effect is on the size of companies. Lower interest rates make it more feasible to pull off mergers and acquisitions. Now, this is something that happens naturally in an economy. When I was a boy, the dairy industry was like, you know, one farmer, 30 cows, little teeny tanker truck that would pick up the milk and deliver the milk. And actually back then, it was such direct production rather than indirect roundabout production that I could see the cows out there across the street. Across the street from where I lived was farmland. So I could go and sort of visually inspect the cows that I was drinking from. And the, we had three dairies in my hometown, 20,000 people, three different dairies. So the little truck would come out from the dairy and pick up the milk, bring it back to the dairy, and then they would package it. And a guy would come to your house about 5 o'clock in the morning dressed in a white suit. And he would put bottles of milk in a little insulated box next to your back door. By the time I was going off to college, the dairies had all gotten much larger. Um, there were, excuse me, the dairy farms got much larger. All three dairies in town were out of business. And so what happened would be a, a very large tanker truck would go to these much larger dairy farms and pick up much larger amounts of milk in a truck that was similar to like a gasoline truck. Carted it off 30 miles to the east of Syracuse where it would be processed in a huge factory dairy and then it would be transported back to my hometown where it would be delivered to supermarkets and you would have to go and get the milk yourself. So everything had completely changed. So these types of changes where you go from like a hundred car companies in 1910 to six or seven after World War II, now to three, I guess it's three American auto companies in the United States. There were hundreds of types of things competing against Coca-Cola, but eventually the market came down to just Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and a few others. So ultra low interest rates tends to lead to quick increases in the size of companies. Now, why would that matter? Why would that matter to skyscrapers? That's right. Bigger companies build bigger buildings because all of a sudden now, this nationwide chain of dairies, they have to have research departments, they have to have human resource departments, accounting departments, marketing departments, 
personnel, all these different things, the headquarters has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The bigger the company, <clears throat> the bigger the headquarters. And that means it increases the demand for office space in the central business district. And the third one is a little more traditional with respect to Cantillon effects. Artificially low interest rates, and which lead to taller buildings and record-setting high buildings, creates a need for brand new construction techniques. So in this modern era of ultra-high, ultra-tall uh, skyscraper building, they've had to come up with new crane systems, new concrete pumping systems. Imagine trying to pump concrete a couple of thousand feet up into the air. It's very difficult. We didn't have that technology um, until recent years. You have all sorts of systems that have to be created brand new. I mentioned a couple of them here. The elevator. Before elevators, the highest a building was, really anywhere in our economy, was four stories high. If it went up any higher without elevators, think of what a pain in the butt that would be, <laughs> walking down, up and down, carrying your groceries and all sorts of things. It would be an immense headache. With the advent of steel beam construction and elevators, we were all of a sudden, we were able in the late 19th century to, to be able to build taller and taller buildings. Um, air conditioning systems. Uh, you know, the air conditioning systems in here is done with very large ductwork. Okay? In the old days, they used to use hot and cold water pipes through the buildings. So you've got stairwells, you've got escalators and elevators, you've got air conditioning, you've got water systems, sewage systems, fire suppressant systems, you have electrical systems, you have communication systems, and all of that has to go from the bottom of the building to the top of the building. That's why we talk about usable, livable space rather than just the ultimate height of a building. So if you have all these systems going through every floor and you want to build taller, then each of those systems has to have a bigger capacity. And yet these bigger capacity systems go through every floor. So they take up square footage on every single floor. I calculated that in a 100-story building, one additional elevator, standard size elevator, eats up enough space, the equivalent of like a dozen efficiency apartments. Again, so that's lost rent. So the companies who build these systems, whether it's the construction equipment or whether it's the systems in the building, they've got to go back to the drawing board and come up with brand new ways of doing things. And so in this sense, the skyscraper, even though it's just an example of what's going on in the economy, you can see how it sort of is going to impact various other industries uh, in the economy. And that's really what the skyscraper curse is about, is looking at a tangible example of what's going on throughout the economy. For example, with... Uh, with elevators, in order to use a traditional steel cable to pull the elevator from the bottom to the top, the cable would have to weigh 24,000 pounds. So recently, within the last 10 or 15 years, a European company has come up with a way of reducing the weight of that cable to less than 2,000 pounds by using... Uh, something that's nearly equivalent to the stuff in the bulletproof jackets that they produce for police and military. 
Kevlar, I think it is. It's a version of Kevlar. A Japanese company came up with a way that instead of running ductwork through all the buildings, through all the floors, and then throughout the floors, which of course takes up about two feet in between every floor, they, they came up with a system that uses a very teeny pipe. So instead of moving around hot and cold water or hot and cold air, they're moving around Freon. And that Freon can, takes up very little space and can more accurately heat and cool the buildings. It can actually take heat from the sunny side of a building and move it to the shady side of the building to balance the heat uh, in rooms throughout that floor. So there's a technology effect going on here uh, as the skyscraper curse is coming. Very important here, I'll emphasize this point a few times, record-setting skyscrapers are merely an illustration of what's going on throughout the economy. So many of the same things that are happening with it are happening with that record-setting skyscraper are happening throughout the economy. So you see not just this one building out in Saudi Arabia, but you, see, you can see the same thing happening here in Auburn, where a record-setting uh, building is happening. You can see the same thing happening in Silicon Valley, where a record-setting uh, building is being constructed. New York City, China uh, are all setting local records for skyscrapers uh, in their area, and it goes well beyond uh, skyscrapers. So with the aid of Austrian Business Cycle plus the skyscraper index, um, as the housing bubble was developing, it actually helped me to understand at an early point in time uh, what was happening to the economy. So with regards to the housing bubble, I wrote an article in 2004 on Mises.org called Housing Too Good to Be True? Question uh, mark. That got me a lot of invitations in the local area to give talks to student groups and business groups. Um, I was at one particular uh, talk where I was talking about um, luxury game day condominiums. In 2004, they were building these luxury game day condominiums, uh, some of which are just right over here. And uh, I was surprised to find that bankers and construction company executives showed up to my talk, and they weren't very happy <laughs> with what I had to say. And it was very uncomfortable because it was in the Foy Union, and there was no doors on where I was lecturing. The doors were all in the back. So I really couldn't make a run for it at that point. <laughs> and I talked about the people I had interviewed who were buying these luxury game day condominiums. And, uh, and I would just tell the audience what people would say. I said, you know, you're paying a lot of money for these luxury game day condominiums. Sure would be a lot cheaper if you just got a hotel room and ate at restaurants. You'd save a lot of money. And you know what everybody, just about everybody said to me when I interviewed these condo owners? They said, well, we could always sell it for more later on. Well, at least they still haven't gotten back to those prices. Uh, 2005, uh, an article, Is the Housing Bubble Topping or Popping? Uh, and that's really when the housing stocks did top. I wrote an article called The Economics of Housing Bubbles in uh, June of 2006, and it was for a book on housing. And uh, I got the distinct impression that the editors were kind of setting me up because they knew I had been writing about bubbles, and they didn't believe in bubbles. They thought it, all, it was all zoning laws and land use restrictions and things like that. And then... By 2007, I wrote an article called We Told You So for LouRockwell.com. Um, later on, uh, I wrote a blog post 
called New Records Skyscraper and Depression in the Making, uh, August 7th, 2007. Now, at that point, nobody was thinking that there's a housing crisis or, you know, people were using the words housing bubble, but they didn't think much of it or that much would come of it. Um, and then uh, another article on LouRockwell.com. And, uh, you know, not that I like to rub things in people's noses or whatever. <laughs> and then after the fact, in 2010, I wrote a longer article, which was just published on uh, Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, called Deception, excuse me, Transparency or Deception, What the Fed Was Saying in 2007. Uh, and this is a, that was a very illuminating article, but all I did was I read the speeches of the top Federal Reserve uh, board members, and they were basically saying everything was hunky-dory in 2007, that they didn't see any possibility of a crisis or a bubble or anything. Uh, so it's a, for an academic article, it's pretty funny stuff. So with all this in mind, um, I was happy to note that when the Burj Khalafi Tower did open in January 8th, 2010, that CNN was kind enough to write this. The one person who wasn't surprised by the economic woes greeting the dedication of the building was Auburn University economist Mark Thornton. He predicted tough times for the Emirate two years ago in a blog entitled New Records Setting Skyscrapers and Depression. Now, I'm not going to go through this literature, but since that time, there's been an emerging uh, academic literature on this subject. Uh, Greg Casa, Gunter Nuffler, uh, Jason Barr is, is one of the main persons uh, in this area. He's a real estate economist at Rutgers University, and so he's written extensively uh, on this subject. In each paper, he seems to find out different causes for variously measured um, measures of real estate and record-setting skyscrapers. Um, and then in 2015, he teamed up with two of his colleagues at, in Rutgers and uh, published a paper called Skyscraper Height and Business Cycle, Separating Myth from Reality. This was not a welcome sight. Basically, they said that I was wrong about the skyscraper curse because they found that skyscraper building did not cause the economic crisis. <laughs> and that some other factor was causing both skyscrapers, record-setting skyscrapers, and crises. Are you serious? Yes. Yes, I am serious. Uh, and so the Economist magazine picked up on this, and they agreed um, the skyscraper curse is just an illusion. And, you know, it, it's bad enough to be criticized like that, but then for the Economist to pick up and pound you down, so I wrote a letter to the editor of The Economist saying that, you know, this, is, this article wasn't right. Uh, you know, the theory of the skyscraper curse is that a third factor like artificially low interest rates causes both record-setting skyscrapers and an economic crisis. They, their empirical evidence, in other words, supported what I had been saying. And so I figure, you know, well, finally I'll get a letter to the editor in The Economist. But it never came out. And then three months later, this was, the article was March 28th, 2015. Um, in the first week of July, I think it was July 2nd, I get an email from The Economist saying that my letter had been misplaced. And it's too late to run it now. So, <laughs> I'm 
I teamed up with Lucas Engelhart in the back, and we decided, well, let's send a comment to the journal in which Barr and his colleagues published the original article. And we're thinking, well, this is a slam dunk, uh, that they got to accept this. Um, but they came back and rejected the comment, which doesn't really happen very often. And the re one of the referees was one of these three men, and I think it was this, I think it was Jason Barr who they sent it to and who um, wrote up the referee report condemning the comment, even though it was pretty clear what we were saying. Um, but we, we realized it was one of them at least because it says it's hard to reject a comment um, that is favorable to your own paper. But he was pulled together enough energy and courage <laughs> to pull that off. And so that's basically when I started thinking about writing a book on this subject, which I have completed. Uh, the Institute is going to publish it, and um, it's dedicated in part to the editors of The Economist magazine <laughs> and the, the editors of that journal, um, Economic Papers. What was it? Economic uh, Applied Economics. Applied Economics. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really remarkable uh, with respect to The Economist because they had been citing my work in favor of the skyscraper curse prior to this. And they even mentioned that in their editorial. And they actually, although they did not refer to me in their editorial, they did reference my paper, Skyscrapers in Business Cycles. But, now get this. That's the, that's the graphic that they put with their article, where you have the various crises, the Panic of 1907, the Great Depression, the 1970s, the Asian financial crisis, and then the Burj Khalafi, okay, which are all, you know, pretty much the crisis starts right before the buildings are completed. So they start during the boom prior, the crisis happens usually right after it reaches record height, and then the buildings open shortly thereafter. Now, if you draw up a graphic like that, and then you say there's, there is no such thing as a skyscraper curse, that's uh, literally beyond my comprehension. <laughs> okay, so our takeaways today is that the skyscraper curse is an illustration of what the Fed is doing to the economy. The Fed effects are pervasive throughout the economy. It doesn't affect every last little teeny thing, but it affects the productive side of the economy um, in a significant way. And it actually affects the government as well because governments are seeing their revenues increase during the boom. So they start spending and investing um, and by the time their projects come online and their revenues are also greatly diminished, uh, they find similar problems in the public sector as well. Uh, the skyscraper curse has a good record of prediction. And actually, it's, you know, where you don't see exact dating of things. Uh, but the one example of the Woolworth building in 1913 we don't remember any economic crisis at that point, right, in the United States. Now, what was happening in World War, I. World War I? Yeah, World War I. So in 1913, right before the Woolworth Building was completed, the U.S. economy went into a severe contraction. But... In early 1913, as the Europeans were gearing up to fight the war, demanding our raw materials and our goods, it was World War I in Europe that led to a revival of the U.S. economy from the steep slump that it had been experiencing. 
So where there was no economic crisis in the U.S. economy, there's a perfectly logical reason why none appear, and that's World War I, the largest configuration of war in the history of man. 20 million casualties were actually counted, and it was probably a lot worse. And then if you add in the pandemic that followed, um, which is related to the war, it was an enormous loss of human life and capital. Mainstream economists resort to all sorts of things, psychological factors, uh, technological factors, uh, but really they fail to come up with an economic explanation uh, for this phenomenon. Uh, Well, the, the only line that's left on my presentation is that the Kingdom Tower, Tower in Saudi Arabia is under construction. The construction is currently stalled, uh, but it's expected to resume shortly, and it is expected also to hit a record uh, height. It's supposed to be one kilometer tall, uh, but, it's, but the top part of it is not usable space, so it only sets the record by... Um, by about 12 stories over the one in Dubai. Uh, the Saudis actually wanted to build a tower that was one mile tall, but the engineers calculated that if they were able to build one one mile tall, that it would simply break through the crust of the earth. It would be so heavy. Okay, thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes, Ted. Uh, have you considered the record, uh, the new records in Christmas and Yes, yes, I have. Uh, I have not looked at it, but the last cruise I was on was ironically the world's largest cruise ship. With that, which one? I don't remember. Uh, the Allure. Yes, that might have been it. Massive. Uh, got lost a couple times. Didn't think I was ever going <laughs> to resurface again. But, um, but I think there, that would be an interesting project for someone to do. Yes, Zach. Um, I'd be curious to know like, why it might apply to a ship as opposed to a skyscraper, because it doesn't have the same restrictions on space. That would but, like, explain why people don't have it. Yeah, I, I don't. In fact, I didn't know much about skyscraper construction when this whole thing started. Um, but fortunately, my brother is is in big time construction, so I have like a tutor uh, on there. But I don't know much at all about the technological requirements of getting bigger and bigger as far as cruise ships are concerned. I'm sure there must be some, but the fact that it, you know, it it just seems like um, it might not be as daunting. A technological task as uh, going up into the sky and trying to elevate, well, just even elevating your workers. Think about, you know, that. I mean, getting your workers from point A to point B, um, you know, in the original steel frame construction, you've probably seen pictures of this of guys walking along beams and stuff like that. Well, one thing they couldn't do when they were, once they were, got up there is you couldn't go to the bathroom. So, you know, there's all sorts of constraints like that. Well, uh, consider that um, uh, skyscrapers don't move. Uh, like, for instance, cruise ships have bridges to clear uh, locks to navigate, what have you. And if they're ocean going, then they'll get stand. Like, for instance, the Allure is set only 17 stories, so they can build a superstructure and construct that. But then, of course, they have to design it the way they want. Yeah, and when you. Yeah, when you build a much larger cruise ship than there's ever been built before, I would imagine you certainly would need um, stabilizers of a lar much larger magnitude. For just as just one example, um, propellers that have to be larger, or you have to come up with some way of constructing the ship so that it's lighter. 
uh, or more balanced. But then, of course, if it's more balanced, then you can get through fewer uh, waterways, uh, canals, and so forth. As a matter of fact, the, um, the uh, Queen Mary II, I took the Queen Mary II over to Europe, uh, back from Europe, and on the way back, you pull into New York Harbor, and you have to cross under a bridge. And literally, it feels like the bridge is like right there. It's so close. It's like you don't want to put your hand up there. Yes, Ryan. With the uh, Kingdom Tower being built now, should we be bracing ourselves for another crash? Yes. <laughs> but bracing yourself is a relative concept. I mean, it's uh, it's it's delayed. It's been delayed several times. Um, it's currently, I believe, delayed. The, the information on this is not easy to get. Um, and uh, And so... Initially, it was supposed to be completed in 2018, but the word completed can mean different things. Uh, I've also seen that it's supposed to open in 2020. That's pretty clear what that means. Um, so it could be, you know, it could be tomorrow. It could be two years from now. So uh, it's a very relative term, and there's nothing precise about the skyscraper index, you know, hitting it in a certain month, for example. I was just very lucky uh, that I had information about the tower in Dubai and um, was able to write that the end was near really about a month, less than a month before things started. It's the slow, steady decline before it hit more rapid declines in 2008. Yes? Did you ever reach out to Barr and have a heart to heart on this? <laughs> no, I didn't really. Um, I contacted him after the paper had been published. He had never contacted me. And um, I wrote and asked him for a copy of the paper. And uh, said I'd like to read it. And I did mention something about, you know, if I come on, on, uh, on you and you come on me, then we both get more citations to our work. And I, not that I need citations, but he, he does. Uh, <laughs> it's just the, the reality of I'm working at the Mises Institute. They don't care how many citations someone gets. Uh, but if you're working at Rutgers, that's all they care. You know, you could be, they don't even read your papers at some universities. They just count citations. Have you just, like, seen in correlation between record setting things? Or is it more, like, widely, like, widely increasing if you're doing skyscrapers? It's a very good question. Um, the skyscraper index and curse is related only to record setting skyscrapers and um, that has to do with the fact that the artificially low interest rates have to be very long and very severe in order to create the type of economy and psychological euphoria that cause people to set new records and um, normal in normal business cycles Sure, real estate does good, construction does good, but they don't typically set new records. And as a result, you get a no more normal bust in the economy rather than an economic crisis. But at the same time, would you expect there to be like more skyscrapers being built at the same time as these records? Yes. Yes, we do. Um, and for two reasons. One is uh, we've seen clusters of records in the past and we also see clusters of skyscraper building um, in the present and in historically. Uh, you know, so there's clusters of tall skyscrapers being built in China, in the Middle East, um, in Manhattan. They're building uh, some very narrow but yet very tall uh, buildings. And uh, the 
one way to measure the amount of skyscraper construction is to look at the number of super high construction cranes. This tells you a little bit about where our current bubble is uh, because the city of Seattle has more of these cranes currently active than both New York City and Los Angeles combined. So it's not the traditional business uh, that's being impacted here, although New York is part of the financial business, obviously. But Seattle is really a hip uh, place, and the businesses uh, that it has um, are leading our leading companies. So Amazon's there, Boeing is there, Nordstrom's is there, uh, Starbucks is there, and then down in California where they're building the tallest building west of the Mississippi, of course you've got Google, you've got um, uh, you know all the tech companies, all the social media companies um, are there. So it's indicative of the type of you know what's really bubbling well, it's Facebook, it's Amazon, it's Netflix, and it's Google. And a lot of those companies are headquartered right there where that building is going up. Okay, we're past time. Thanks.